my apologies for that incredibly professional appearance. But, uh, I'm at least finally here. So. Thank you for calling me. I assume that was you. have my USB with me, but I do have them on an email. So if there's an email that's featureable from here, then I can email them to there. Yeah. And then we can have a link. If assuming this one has internet. It should have. <laughs> yeah. So that seems like a thing that most computers have in this day and age. Yeah. Again, all of this is my fault, none of the organizers, just making that clear. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to log on to this one, but uh, if there's an email that can be accessed here, I can send an email to this machine. Yeah. It's a password situation I got right now. Okay, okay. I think that's something yeah. that that would be best. Yeah. Right. Um. Which one of these is the easiest? <laughs> yeah. Um. So this is the reason I'm supposed to be here 15 minutes beforehand. So uh, <laughs> hopefully it should be resolved in like a couple of minutes. I'm super sorry. You can type in that one. Yes. this one is better because I actually don't remember the password yep. for the other one. <laughs> Thank you so much for helping me out. Of course, it's what I'm here for. So. All right, I need my phone. Yeah, I'm, I haven't sent it yet. I just got the link and now I need to send it myself. So, just a second. Now is when I need email. Uh, should have gotten a link, an email that contains a link to a Google slide presentation. <coughs> this one. That, that's the one. That's the one. All right. There. And I think I can already uh, log out. Should not. Yes. Once it's open, it should be fine. Yeah. So. There you go. It's now in Finnish, but... Um, that is not a problem, because I only need to see my slides as long as I can uh, get this up onto the projector. Yes. Is it connected properly? Yeah, it's yep. connected. Just it just needs to be turned on. Down. Yep. Uh, that makes sense. It might take a while to reboot, but... 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that uh, mm, is it here? No, this thing's just there. Is this it? So, so we're almost there. Uh, one more button and we're done. If we find the right button. Uh, it should be this one. Yeah. Or do you not have access to that? Uh, okay, if, uh, if things were in a crawl. <laughs> oh, if things were in a call. That's interesting. That might, yeah. I don't know why. Uh, I oh. can deliver the presentation with this like this. It's not as nice, but uh, I guess I'm thinking. Wait, wait. Okay. Wait. <laughs> I'll make sure this is okay. Because I'm locked out. Ah, uh, like okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's all. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> now we're logged in. So and then we refresh, refresh, and then you should have access to actually display it. Yes. Yes. All right. And there we go. So, uh, hello, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for your patience. We are now finally starting about 10 minutes late. So, my name is Thomas Yuan Person, as you can see down there. And this is the doctor I'm going to go for how to make a micro RPD. So the talk is going to be a lot of me presenting ideas. And my goal is to give these ideas so that you can actually use them. So please do stop me and ask me questions. Because um, uh, I'm here to make sure that this is something that you can use, not just something that you understand in your brain. Right? So that's my hope. So this is a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an indie RPD designer and author because if you're an RPG designer, you automatically have to be an author because you write a book. So I also do programming and I'm a design student for video games. So a little bit about who I am and where I'm from. Um, down here at the bottom, we can see the games that I've made. Uh, two, the two on your left, those would be my pen and paper RPGs. And the last one is a card game over there. So. Um, OK, the overview for this talk is we're going to talk about these four things. First, what do I actually mean by micro RPG? Right? What is the whole thing that I'm trying to talk about? And a little bit about why we should care about them. And then I'm going, out, uh, going to talk about different types of games and different styles of games, because knowing what is out there is really, really helpful when you make your own thing, either because you want to fit into a style that already exists and borrow from that style, or because you want to do something that's not out there. right? And I'm going to go over specifically like uh, design processes surrounding games, how they tend to look like, some things to look for, and some ways to make that process faster and smoother. And finally, I'm going to talk about something I call the smallest game possible, which is uh, sort of like a tool set or like an idea for how to get new games up and running fast. I'm just going to turn on my stopwatch. So uh, first chapter, micro RPGs. Uh, in general, there's a couple of things that you can look for when you're looking to determine whether or not a game is a micro RPG, right? So typically, games that have almost no text to them are micro. I mean, micro means small, short text means small book, it's a micro, right? That makes sense. Sometimes it's just one page, literally just an A4 and that's it, and with an illustration and everything. And all the rules fit there. Sometimes it's you have 13 pages of rules and like uh, 100 pages of supplementary material. Um, I've also seen that happen. It's very funny. Uh, it's, it's a Kickstarter special thing. Um, usually these games focus on doing exactly one thing and they have a very strong theme, right? Uh, for example, you are, for example, uh, you are in orbit around a planet and your spaceship has been quarantined because there's an alien life form on board. That's your game. That's a hyper-specific scene, a hyper-specific, almost scenario-like situation. And then you make a game surrounding that. And that's one of the ways that you can get it to be so small. In that case, uh, just one page. Um, and usually, they have about one big mechanic that they use. Uh, in the game I just talked about, the in-orbit game, uh, the one mechanic that they use is determining, does the monster attack or not? And that's highly dependent on how many players are, in, are present right now and a couple of dice that roll hiddenly. So it has this one big idea that it uses to play a, the whole game, and everything is just tied into that one mechanic. 
And the third one, fourth and final one is that usually you spot them primarily at conventions. Because a lot of these micro RPG games are made specifically to be played at conventions because that's where a lot of people need something short and fast to play. Are you with me so far? Good. And here are some examples that people might, have, might recognize. I've been playing two of these profusely this weekend. Um, uh, specifically, Listen, Feelings, and Honey Heist. I haven't played Fiasco in a while, but it's up there for a good reason. Uh, do, how many of us have tried any of these games? Look, there we go, there we go. Speaking to the right crowd. Uh, that's good. And uh, there's actually a good reason why, when I'm talking about making RPGs, that I start with a micro RPG. And it's not just about scale. I mean, they do have a very manageable size. They're very small, which means you can start have an idea, develop it, and be done within a pretty good time frame. It doesn't have to take two years to make a micro RPG. And if you're just starting out trying something, you might not even know if you want to do it or if you like doing it. It might just be a cool idea, and you'll find out it's not really for you. It's, you'd rather find that out in two months than in two years. Right? Um, another thing is, conceptually, they tend to be pretty simple systems. I mean, if you have one mechanic, and everything ties to that, right? then you're not going to have to worry about 15 different classes and all of the supplement books that you might have for like a large sprawling game. So that means that your job as a designer, especially if it is your first game, is going to be much more manageable. And uh, yeah, the very last thing I'm going to say that I think is the absolutely biggest, bigger than all of the rest of these combined, because like you can make a 200 page Mastodon game as your first game if you really love it. Um, but micro RPGs, are faster to test. You usually have a simple idea, and you go from idea to something you can play relatively quickly. And that's really why I think it's good to start with these games early, because they teach you really good habits in how to design games that will last you for a long time in case you decide to produce design for more. Um, and then we're going to talk a bit more about uh, what kind of styles are out there. So. Generally speaking, when I talk about different types of games, uh, right now I'm not talking about game mastering style or like play style. I'm talking about style and what kind of game it is, like what kind of rules do they have, how it is set up, how it explains that kind of style. And inside of that whole area, there is a couple of factors that tend to be the, like the dividing lines that differentiate different styles of games. Um, one of the most uh, contentious tends to be, do we have a game master or not? Because there tend to be strong preferences if you prefer to have a game master in your game or not to, right? Um, and that tends to create a very clear divide of what type of game you're making and what type of stories and gameplay sessions that your players are going to have. Uh, other stuff is, how do we handle random elements? Do we have random elements? Do we have a lot of them or not a lot of them? Uh, do we like to structure everything very strictly? Do we just want to freeform a little bit of uh, structure to it? And yeah, playtime is intended to be a one-shot game, it's intended to be a campaign game. Is it intended to be some kind of a new format that we haven't seen yet? And I think, especially if you're doing something for a convention, something you really need to worry about is how long is it going to take to play? Am I looking for something that takes me an hour to play, three hours to play, or do I want to dedicate an entire weekend to it? Um, these are important things to consider and have in the back of your head when you think about a game you want to make because they're going to help you find examples of games that are maybe doing something you might want to copy a lot faster. Apologies. Um, so, uh, let's start talking about the whole GM situation. Um, there's a lot of people who love debating this. I personally don't understand why. Uh, but people do. So I thought I'd break down the way I look at these types of distinctions and one way to think about it. Uh, and hopefully that distinction and way to think about what's the difference between a game master game, a GMS game, and even more out there stuff that are even rebelling at the GMS games. Um, where GMLED, I think most of us here are aware of this one. If you are here and you don't know what a GMLED game is, you probably have heard of it as Dungeons and Dragons. And if you still don't know what I'm talking about, welcome. Uh, I'm happy to invite you to this new hobby. Uh, you found a good place to be. And 
After that, we have GMLess, which is a lot less rare, like a lot less rare. This is where uh, the GM style is where all of role playing games started. And then GMLess came around in maybe like late 90s, early 2000s. So we have like a 30 year difference in how old these styles are. And then you have these even weirder games that have always kind of just existed on the side uh, ever since GMLess games uh, appeared. So uh, I am going to talk a little bit about what these look like in practice as well. But the overview is we have a strong game master who handles the, uh, the world around you. We say, no, we don't want to have a game master. Everybody's going to take turn doing that in some way. Or we say, no, that's boring. I've done that same structure for 20 years now. I want to change it and do something wild and different. And it's, it's just an others category, pretty much. Um, and mostly the difference between these boils down to like one big theoretical concept, which is who gets to decide what part of the game we're playing, right? So if we think about it, uh, a traditional game master is in charge of the whole of the world, right? You're in charge of what is present, what has happened before, what are history of this place, what does it look like, sound like, smell like, what is moving here, what has recently happened here. That's a traditional job of the game master, right? Um, the whole of the world. And just in terms of play style, in a lot of games, when you have a game master, one of the reasons you want one is because then you have somebody who can be the final say in how far away are they exactly. Like, this is a question that's very important in a lot of rule sets. So a lot of games need somebody to be able to say, no, they are exactly 150 feet away. Because sometimes that matters. Uh, and usually you have a game master. All of like the space inside of your world that you're playing in, like the physical area you're in, is decided upon by the game master. Uh, and then we get to like this middle area, which is kind of everything that's happening immediately right now. It's a little harder to pin down exactly, but uh, for example, if I say I want to uh, punch the baron in the face, uh, that's an action I'm saying. This is my action I want to do. And then typically we'll need to roll some dice and then there'll be an outcome which the game master describes. Here's a bit of difference. Some games will say that it doesn't have to be the game master. If I win my roll, then I get to describe it. So this is where we start to get some differences in different types of different games inside of the same kind of stuff. So, so this is pretty much that, right? The game master is all of the world, almost. It doesn't do like your character's backstory. That's belongs to a player typically. Uh, and almost based all around forms and all of can cannot. Like, can I climb out this wall? No, you cannot. Or yes, you can try, but you have to roll. For it. And the player does everything that is their characters and absolutely nothing else. And no one else. Right? Very classic. Dealless uh, makes it up a bit. And instead of having a game master role that you have all of the time and a player role that you have all of the time. You have two different types of role, which is the scene framer, which is where it starts every scene. So unlike a traditional game master game, uh, GMS games are always, almost always run in scene. So we say now we start the scene, we play a little bit, and then we end the scene. Same thing about like a movie or a book in some cases. And whoever starts the scene has a lot of the same power that the GM had in the beginning, right? You control all of the world. And usually, when you're talking about the outside world, you're going to talk about it at the beginning of the scene. And this, so whoever is starting the scene, takes over a lot of the GM ship responsibility for setting up the scene, figuring out where are we, what has happened before, how much time has passed, uh, all of the plot that happens at the beginning and in between as well. Um, and once we've done that, once we've started the scene, everybody moves into kind of like the same role. Everybody is doing a little bit of everything. But the one thing you can't do is somebody else's character. So in this sense, uh, it's kind of like you take this game master, well, all the world and a lot of the plot stuff, the whole space, and then you put that onto one person in the beginning. And once that beginning is done, everybody does a little bit. So you could argue that a GMless game is, in fact, a game where you take turns being a game master. 
I would probably agree with you. Some people would not. But these terms exist, and for that reason, they can sometimes be useful. Um, yes. So this is one of the important concepts of this talk. So I want to take a stop to see, do I have questions about this? And don't be shy, because this, this slide does not explain a lot either. You're feeling good? Yeah? Sweet. You are on board with this. So pretty much, uh, with the difference of these two, what I'm looking at, starting already here, arrives at this. The way I view RPGs is that there is a special type of conversation with a slightly unusual goal of usually creating this like fun experience or creating a story, usually both, that come with a bunch of extra rules of what you're allowed to say. Uh, and rather than to go and say, oh, I have to do it this way because I've always done it this way, or I have to do it this way because this way is the old boring way, just pick something that works for what you're trying to create. Because at the end of the day, your game is going to be a set of rules for how people can have a conversation. And it's up to you to steer that conversation in a direction that you're interested in. So, and now we're getting into the uh, design part. Um, when we're making games, we are dealing with something which is normally called fun. We're trying to make a thing, we're engaging with the thing we're making, is supposed to be fun. And fun has a couple of different problems with it. Uh, number one, it's not measurable. It's incredibly subjective, and people will think different things are fun. So how are we going to measure that? Answer is, we, generally speaking, can't. can't. So what we do is we try to make games, and we give it to people and see if they like it. And if they say they like it, then maybe they had fun. Hopefully, that's what we want to do. Uh, to make this even more complex, it's super hard to predict what somebody will think is fun when they're actually sitting down to play. Because you can have an idea, and this has happened to me so many times, that you can have an idea of exactly how you imagine something's going to play out, and like, oh yeah, I think that's going to be super fun, this interaction is going to be real cool, you're going to have tough choice there. And then the people play it, and it just doesn't work for them. So predicting whether or not something's going to be fun is partly predicting who's going to be playing it and what they're going to enjoy, but also predicting outcomes of moving pieces that you haven't seen moving, and that can combine in ways that you probably haven't thought of. Uh, so for that sense, I have this entire slide about it's really hard to predict what is going to be fun in a game. And this is kind of like the fundamental concept that underlies how we design games. Uh, so the first thing we, uh, you realize is we can't go from A to B. And what I mean by that is we can't go, oh, first I decide how my game is going to look like, and then I'm going to create my game, and then I'm done. That's going from A to B, going from concept, idea, straight to making it, and then saying, it's done, I'm going to ship it. That's not a design game. It's an authored game. It might even be good. But you're taking one hell of a game. Um, because the only way to really know if the game is good is, in fact, you try. And again, and again, and again. And uh, the problem with this is quite obvious for all the games, right? Normally, if a play session for us is anywhere between two to eight hours, and you need to try it over and over and over again, that is a lot of time spent. So uh, we need to think of a clever way to deal with that. And the usual advice is to work in really small chunks. So if I want to have a cool spell system, a cool weapon system, five classes, and I don't know what else, some kind of strange uh, alchemy-based level up system, whatever it is, I'm going to pick one of those to work on first. Because if I try to do all of it at once, I need to make so much before I get to the point that I'm testing that I'm doing the A to B thing again. So one of the first things you're always looking for is like, how small can I make something so that I can, as soon as possible, test it to see that it works the way I thought? Um, which ties into the question of how fast can I test something? If something is quick to test, Always do that first. Always do the thing that you can test and try and see if it works first. 
because that will give you information about your game, will give you information about the type of game you're making, and will give you information on the type of player who's interested in your game. And that information is what you need to turn your game into something that really gets designed and polished. Uh, but there's two more questions here that are pretty important to talk about, which is the what do I test first? Let's start with that. Because uh, I talked about this hypothetical game that has a bunch of different systems, all of these five classes, for example. And if I want to test it as fast as possible, I'm not going to make five classes. That's a lot. I might make two. I'll make one first to see that the system is fun to use when building, and then I'll make a second one to compare them. But which ones? And this is incredibly important. Uh, this is also incredibly game specific. Which features, or which parts, or which systems in your game are going to be unique to your game are going to largely inform what I want to test first. Because usually you want to test something that's difficult to pull off, that's very, or uh, so that you know if you can pull it off, or something that's very rewarding if you get it right. So. Uh, and it kind of boils down to why am I making this game in the first place, right? Because at the end of the day, you probably sat down to make a game because you wanted to play a game like that, right? Most of us do that, not always, uh, but that's a very common thing. So most of the time, if I'm sitting down to make a game, it's because I want to play that game, which means the thing that I want to play most is probably the thing I should test first. We have a bit of this luxury in uh, indie role-playing games that the scene is so small, it is not exactly people's livelihoods at stake, that we can afford to have ourselves be a little bit at the target audience. Outside and other types of games, that's a really dangerous thing to do. In video games, oh, sorry, in pen and paper, we can afford that. So uh, this is a, another way to talk about the same thing, kind of. And for those of you who have seen any kind of design before, you'll notice that this is an off-brand version of the design cycle. And I wrote it like this because I thought it was slightly less stuffy this way. So generally speaking, you'll start by having some idea. Uh, imagine there being an extra box up in the corner. 